Today we have Jimmy Yee speaking with us. He is an associate professor at UCSF. He did his PhD at University of California, San Diego. Uh, did a postdoctoral research at the Broad Institute and worked with the Beaver Gev, which always seems to be a great career move. And uh, during his postdoc, Jimmy had a leading role with Inver Consortium, um, which was involved in looking at uh, genetic variation across the human population in, uh, in terms of contact immunology. And uh, Jimmy does truly interdisciplinary work with expertise in functional genomics, single cell genomics, computer science, and immunology. He has numerous recent publications in top journals. And recently, he has developed an algorithm that enables population scale single cell genomics by levering natural genetic variation, which I believe uh, he will talk about today. So, Jimmy, thanks very much for agreeing to speak with us, and we're looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you so much, Joshua, for the kind introduction. Um, everybody can hear me and see my slides, right? Yeah, no problem. Great. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that my lab has been doing for the past five years or so, um, a combination of methods development as well as their application to understand complex autoimmunity. Um, and, you know, so I'd like to start by showing sort of a slide of um, the scale that the community has been performing single cell sequencing experiments. I'd like to show this to my first year graduate students and to try to convince them that they should uh, probably work on single cell sequencing um, in some capacity or other. And so on the x axis here is um, the uh, is time and y axis is a log number of cells sequenced over time. This is uh, adapted from the Svetson et al. Nature Protocols paper. Um, and you know that paper was published in 2018, so it's we're a few years behind what um, the scaling that's currently happening in single cell genomics. And so you know this is reminiscent of what happened when we were sequencing the human genome, uh, when we're experiencing exponential growth in terms of the number of cells or the number of data points that we're collecting uh, over time. And whenever you see something like this, it's almost always driven by technological advances. Um, in the case of sort of single cell sequencing, you know, it really took off, sorry, for my messed up in the slides here. In the case of single cell sequencing, we started with in picking individual cells, uh, but the field really took off with the advent of microwells and microfluidics, and then massively parallel single cell sequencing was introduced um, through DropSeq and then commercialized by 10X Genomics, which utilizes very small volume microfluidic droplets to encapsulate cells and, and perform molecular biology at scale. And so, you know, that's certainly the workhorse these days for performing single cell sequencing in most labs. And here's my cartoon representation of droplet-based single cell sequencing. Um, we take a, a vial of blood or, or any cells in suspension or nuclei actually, and encapsulate them in a physical droplet and each droplet will be labeled by a DNA barcode. There are other ways of doing single cell sequencing, but the concept is basically the same, is that you want to be uh, able to physically label a cell with a unique DNA barcode, whether or not that's using droplets, wells, or the cell membrane itself. Uh, in the case of single cell RNA sequencing, uh, in droplets, uh, what happens is that um, it's governed by a Poisson process. So for most of your droplets to contain only an individual cell, uh, in fact, you have to um, make sure that the majority of your droplets uh, will be empty. Um, and so that reduces the probability that two cells are simultaneously encapsulated. And so for a standard 10x genomics assay, the target is sequencing 5,000 to about 10,000 cells at a collision rate of about 5%. And what you get out from this experiment is, is basically a matrix. Uh, the rank of the matrix is the number of features that you're measuring. So for RNA, there'll be 30,000 genes in the genome. And the number of rows of the matrix is the number of cells that we sequence. Again, by about 10,000 is what's recommended. And you'll see a number of figures that, that I'll show later where we project that 30,000 dimensional data set down to two dimensions just for ease of visualization. Um, and cells that are close to each other uh, will be represented uh, cells that are phenotypically related to each other will be closer to each other in sort of this arbitrary two-dimensional space. Okay, so um, so certainly the workhorse for that the workhorse to do single cell sequencing using droplets has been used for a number of different disciplines. Increasingly that technology is being used to, to understand differences 
in cell composition as well as cell states between um, patients with a particular disease versus healthy controls or to monitor how um, a patient's um, cells are responding to treatment. And so uh, a project that my lab has participated in um, that was published last year in Cell was to look at tumor infiltrating immune cells in the context of bladder cancer. And just to highlight sort of what you can do with an unbiased approach like that, uh, like single cell sequencing, is um, we really wanted to understand uh, what are the frequencies and the heterogeneity of T cells that are infiltrating bladder cancer. Um, and one of the first results we saw, this is independent of in single cell sequencing, is that in bladder cancer, uh, the vast majority of T cells that infiltrate the tumor are in fact CD4 positive and not CDA positive. And that's interesting because almost all of the checkpoint blockade molecules uh, are essentially trying to either reinvigorate CD8 T cells or to recruit new CD8 T cells into the tumor to kill it. Um, and so we were curious about what the role of CD4 T cells are in, in bladder cancer. And so we performed single cell RNA sequencing of the CD4s and CD8s. And really, to our surprise, what we found are a number of really interesting states in these CD4 positive T cells. Uh, it's been known for a long time that CD4 is in tissue uh, would have this immune suppressive uh, function or regulatory T cells are common in tissue. And certainly we see that. Um, and those are the cells on the left tagged by FOXP3. Um, but what was really surprising are these two populations of cytotoxic CD4, so in purple um, and brown, uh, that are, that's basically a phenotype that's usually only observed in CD8s or CD4s in culture, but that's often thought to be an artifact of the culture. Um, and it's not well understood whether or not these uh, cytotoxic CD4s would actually be um, in real tissue or in circulation. Um, and so that's, that was quite a surprise when we found these cytotoxic CD4s um, in filtrating bladder cancer. And so we, you know, next asked whether or not these um, cytotoxic CD4s can actually act as killer T cells uh, and neutralize the tumor. Um, and the answer is yes. So that's what we're showing on the right. If we track the frequency of dead cells over time, um, we can see that if you just uh, put in the tumor itself autologously, uh, the tumor itself, there's no killing. But if you now um, put in the autologous tumor with CD4 T cells, uh, there is actually a more increased death of these uh, CD4, uh, of these tumor cells. And that increase is even um, higher if we only isolate effector CD4s or the cytotoxic CD4s uh, and get rid of the regulatory CD4s uh, that would be immunosuppressive. Um, and then the last result here is that unlike CD8s that recognize MHC class one molecules, um, the CD4s that kill tumor, in fact, kill the tumor by recognizing MHC class two molecules. So they're not magically becoming a CD8 T cell, they just kill tumor using a different mechanism. Okay, so that's sort of, you know, using standard technologies that's available to, to everybody these days to, to sort of profile um, um, tumor immunity. And admittedly, these are fairly large effect sizes that wouldn't require a lot of samples uh, to be able to see. Um, but what my lab has been interested in is, is to try to use single cell genomics to understand complex human diseases. Um, and one of the diseases that we're interested in is systemic lupus erythematosus which is a systemic autoimmune disease that's extremely heterogeneous. Um, and to understand a complex disease like this, um, there's really a need to scale the number of samples that we process uh, using single cell sequencing if we wanna be able to detect subtle shifts in cell composition or to uh, detect subtle shifts in activation state of cells. And so actually on the right, this is some real data that I'm gonna uh, get into in a second. Uh, but they, that's basically showing in the two-dimensional projection of millions of cells, a density plot of cells um, from healthy control samples, as well as uh, cells from lupus patients. And so I hope what you can appreciate from this is that more or less um, every cell type is represented in both healthy controls and in cases, but in cases there's sort of this um, subtle shift in the frequency of uh, particular cell types as well as cell states. And so to be able to detect this robustly, we need lots of samples and we wanna be able to do experiments in a way where we um, minimize or eliminate as much as we can experimental confounding effects. Uh, another application for population scale single cell sequencing um, is to do genetic analysis. So if we actually collected single cells from lots of people and we also have matching genotypes, then we could try to associate genetic variants 
with um, gene expression in specific cell types, uh, or um, you know, words to detect cis EQTLs that are cell type specific, and that we think by identifying EQTLs that are cell type specific, we can better annotate genetic variants associated with common diseases. So, uh, so that's the motivation for for wanting to do population single cell sequencing. Um, but the standard technology is actually really difficult to, to apply for population scale projects, mostly because of expense. Um, and so in 2018, we uh, came up with an approach that significantly reduces the cost for performing um, single cell sequencing across population cohorts. And the way we do this, and this is in collaboration with Human Kang, um, who's a professor at, at Michigan, um, is to basically do something very simple experimentally. We're going to take cells from genetically unrelated individuals and just pull those cells together prior to doing single cell RNA sequencing. And it turns out that there's enough genetic information carried in the transcriptome of a single cell that we could computationally assign that cell to a donor of origin if we had the prior genotypes of the, of the individuals that went into the pool. Um, and, and as many of you know, genotyping individuals is actually very, very cheap. We could do this with just HLA typing, um, but usually we get the genotypes through um, a, a microarray. So the algorithm is called demuxlet. But in addition to assigning cells correctly to the donor origin, the other thing that the algorithm does is it could identify instances where two cells from different individuals will be simultaneously encapsulated. And in fact, it's that feature of the algorithm that allows us to increase the throughput for single cell sequencing, because now we can just put more cells into the instrument and we're, we can tolerate a higher doublet rate because we can identify cases where doublets from different cells can be are simultaneously encapsulated and throw that data away. Um, and so the result of running multiplex single cell sequencing is that we get more cells um, per run of the instrument, but for each cell, we can also uh, sort of color them here based on which donor they came from, as long as we have the prior genotype information. So the throughput increase here, at least on the prep side, is about fivefold. Um, here, sample information is automatically encoded in the transcriptome of a cell. Uh, we show in our paper in 2018 that this approach is highly accurate, and it's very simple to do experimentally. We just pool up single cells together. Um, and it's applicable, applicable to a number of single cell sequencing experiments, as long as you're sampling natural genetic variants. That it's not limited to just single cell RNA sequencing. It also works with single cell attack seq or um, other types of uh, DNA sequencing. And importantly, uh, we also minimize batch effects this way because uh, we uh, essentially randomize samples that we are interested in to process them simultaneously. Uh, there are other approaches that are similar, including multi-seq, which, which uses uh, cholesterol as a way to label cells, as well as cell hashing, which uses antibodies, and 10x is now releasing a kit to also do multiplexing. But I should say that all of these methods actually will, um, you know, they incur an additional cost, uh, but for our own experience, there are issues with sort of running each of them. Um, no barcode is as good as, as sort of a natural genetic barcode. And, um, and so, you know, I think this concept of using DNA as a way to tag molecules is really powerful. Something else we could do, uh, which is a fairly recent development, is take antibodies and conjugate DNA molecules onto these antibodies. Um, and because DNA is a discrete barcode, uh, if we do this, we could uh, really increase the, th the number of uh, surface proteins or intracellular proteins that could be measured simultaneously. So compared to FACTS or CYTOF, which measures four to 16 markers for FACTS or 50 markers for CYTOF, um, CYTSEQ, which is the approach that uses DNA barcoded antibodies to profile surface proteins, um, can measure 100 markers plus. Currently, the commercial kits are already um, up to about 300 self-surface markers. And then we can also encode additional information using this approach. Um, and so multiplexing also works when you uh, do something like site-seq, where you simultaneously get surface protein information as well as uh, transcript abundance from the same cells. Um, and so I just want to quickly walk you through this a little bit, just because um, conceptually, sometimes uh, it's still a little bit difficult for people to digest. So imagine that we uh, have three different droplets. In the first droplet, we encapsulated two different cells. The second droplet, we encapsulated a blue cell. And the third droplet, we encapsulated a orange cell. And for each of these cells, we uh, a priori stain the cells with antibodies. So that uh, orange cell in the first droplet contains two copies of the surface protein. 
And so when you do single cell site seek, what you get is basically um, both transcripts as well as uh, surface protein abundance um, because there are DNA molecules that's now attached or cDNA molecules that are attached um, to um, molecules on the surface of a uh, B that's labeled with a barcode for that droplet. And so if you actually uh, were quantifying a transcript that has a genetic variant in it that distinguishes these two individuals, um, we can use that information to know that, um, for example, that droplet two actually came from the blue individual and then droplet three came from the orange individual because they're different at this particular genotype. Um, and then we also know that droplet one contains um, cells from both of these individuals, right? So that's basically how the Muxlet works is we look at the genetic variation. But we only need a limited amount of genetic variation. And because there's cell barcodes associated with each of these molecules, um, even though there's only a single transcript here, transcript one, that will allow us to demultiplex, we can also gain information about that second transcript, even though there's no genetic information that distinguishes the individuals, because all of these uh, the transcripts are linked now by a cell barcode. Right, so we know that transcript two, there's two copies um, and that belongs to individual blue. And then uh, there's two copies, of, uh, there's only one copy of transcript two and that belongs to the orange individual. And then the same thing with um, the antibodies. And so even though we don't have information, genetic information about the antibodies or this other transcript, we can still assign abundances correctly to, to the individual. Okay, um, and so since the development of, of the Muxlet, um, we've also now applied it to um, some multi-ohm data sets. So this is simultaneously profiling um, chromatin accessibility as well as gene expression from the same cells. Um, and so on the left is a projection of the multimodal data um, in two dimensions. Again, cells here are colored by cell type. Uh, these are all cells from circula uh, in circulation. Um, and then on the right two panels, we're showing um, the demultiplexing of cells to individuals from using the chromatin accessibility data alone in the middle, this is the taxic data, and then using the gene expression data alone, right? So both pieces of uh, information that we get has genetic information in it in this case. Um, and so we could do um, a demultiplexing using both pieces of information and we basically get the same result. So, um, so we've, been since the development of, of Demuxa, we've been sort of thinking about what we could use it for. Um, in fact, the development of the method is very, very much motivated by, by this particular project that we wanted to carry out for quite some time. You know, we've been interested in um, profiling in a really unbiased way, circulating immune cells from patients with autoimmunity, in particular uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. Um, and we performed this study using Demuxlet where we sequenced about 1.2 million cells. Um, from about 250 samples, um, about 100 of them are of Asian ancestry and 150 are of European ancestry. We sequenced about 5,000 cells per donor um, and 165 are from patients, 100 are age and gender matched controls. Uh, we did this experiment over a total of four batches um, or roughly about 30 different pools. For the first two batches, we just did single RNA sequencing. And then for the second batch, we also stained the cells with antibodies, either a 16-plex antibody panel or a 99-plex antibody panel. And, um, and so this is what the data looks like uh, when you project 1.2 million cells into two dimensions. Um, each dot here represents a single cell again, and again, cells that are close to each other are phenotypically related. Um, because these are circulating immune cells, we know a lot about the composition of circulating immune cells and, and um, encouraging to see that we recapitulate what we expect to see, including four populations of myeloid cells, so non-classical monocytes, classical monocytes, conventional dendritic cells, as well as plasma cytoid dendritic cells, and um, six populations of lymphocytes, so natural killer cells, CD4 positive and CDA positive T cells, um, B cells, a small population of plasma blasts, proliferating lymphocytes, um, and a very small population of CD4, CD34 positive progenitor cells. So if we take all this data, do the multiplexing, um, and then make a projection of um, the density of where cells from either cases or controls go in, in this new map plot, we see uh, what I showed earlier, which is that it seems like there's a shift um, in the composition as well as the cell state uh, of cells coming from um, patients. And this is true for both patients of European ancestry as well as East Asian ancestry. So I'll talk a little bit more about what, what these shifts in state are. 
Um, before we get there, though, I just want to sort of take a step back because I'm showing you a lot of data. And, and so one thing we wanted to do is just to evaluate how good is genetic multiplexing. Um, and the way we're going to do that is we're, we're going to first group cells together. We're going to take all the four um, innate immune populations, the myeloid cells, um, and group them together. And then we're going to take the multiple um, lymphoid populations, the lymphocytes together, and, and, and group that together. Uh, and so if we do that, we can quickly ask whether or not there's a change in the frequency of, of myeloid cells versus lymphocytes in, in patients. Um, and the answer is yes. And this is a known feature of lupus is that patients have lymphopenia. Uh, so they have fewer, um, the frequency of lymphocytes is lower in lupus patients. Um, and then the frequency of myeloid cells is higher. Now, because we're doing single cell sequencing and that we're sampling a fixed number of cells per individual, a change in frequency could be due to changes in abundances of one or both populations. Um, and so we wanted to ask, we wanted to convert these frequency measures to absolute abundance or absolute number of cells per volume, um, and then uh, and, and ask whether or not there's a change in, in the abundance of, of each of these populations. Now, the other reason we want to convert this to absolute abundance is that in the electronic health records of the same samples that we processed, uh, there's a complete blood count which measures the number of lymphocytes and monocytes per volume of blood. And so it's a really nice positive control to assess whether or not the single cell sequencing experiment is actually quantitative. And keep in mind what we're doing here, we're taking fr frozen circulating blood cells, white blood cells, thaw them, multiplex, do single cell sequencing, genotype, demultiplex, sign cell types, and aggregating cells together. And so there's quite a few steps. And, and so we wanted to make sure that this approach is actually robust quantitatively. And so we were really surprised when we saw how well correlated estimates of uh, lymphocyte and monocyte abundance from the single cell sequencing data is compared to the, what's reported in the EHR. For monocytes outside of these two outliers, it's about 0.89 correlation. For lymphocytes, it's really good. It's something like 0.95. So that gave us a lot of confidence that the data is very quantitative. It's actually capturing variability, certainly in composition between individuals. But of course, all we wanted to do is, is, is identify lymphopenia in lupus patients. That wouldn't be very interesting and we wouldn't want to just run single cell sequencing with it. Um, but what's really great about single cell sequencing is it's unbiased and we can now start asking questions about exactly what populations uh, within circulation are depleted in, in lupus patients. And so what we notice is that it's really a drop in the CD4 positive T cells. In fact, if we further phenotype this, it's a drop in um, the frequency of naive CD4s in lupus patients. And this is even more uh, significant in East Asian patients. Right, this is actually what I just said. So if you compare um, the changes in case control percentage for each of 11 major cell types, we can see that for most cell types, it's very similar between um, the ancestry, individuals of different ancestries, but for CD4 positive T cells, um, Patients of Asian ancestry have about a 20% reduction, and the European ancestry, it's about a 10% reduction. So when we saw this result, especially since our patients at UCSF, a number of them um, have been treated for a very long time, we wonder whether or not this is a treatment effect. Uh, but it turns out that that's not the case. Although most of our patients are treated, um, there are a handful of patients of both ancestries who have not been on any um, immunosuppressive uh, treatments, including steroids, for the past six months. And it looks like they still have a decrease in the frequency of CD4s. So this is likely not uh, a treatment effect. If we dig into the lymphocytes a little bit more, I mentioned earlier that there's de this depletion of naive CD4s um, in lupus patients, but we also see um, an expansion of some additional populations that we thought were interesting. In particular, um, there are three different subsets of effector CD8 T cells that are distinguished by the expression of various effector molecules. So there's a granzyme H population, a granzyme K population, and then a population of mucosal associating variant T cells. Um, and we were particularly interested in this granzyme H population because it appears to be increased in frequency in lupus patients. Again, this is uh, consistent in both ancestries. In some of these patients, these cells make up 50% of all the lymphocytes in circulation. Uh, if we you know, if we take a look at these granzyme HCD8s a little bit more, what we notice is that they are a heterogeneous population. In fact, um, there's three critical um, gene signatures that they express. There is a type 1 interferon stimulated gene response, which is usually a, a 
uh, signal that we see in, in um, acute viral response. And this is a known signature of lupus. And so we see that some of the cells from this population do express type 1 interferon stimulator genes. Uh, but some of these cells are cytotoxic. So they're you know, secreting granzymes and other, other molecules that are known to kill target cells. And then some of these are exhausted. So they've been activated for a long time and they no, they're no longer functional. But what's interesting and what's, uh, what was really only revealed from single cell sequencing is that it looks like very different sets of cells uh, are expressing cytotoxic exhaustion type 1 ISG. So it's not the same cells that are producing these signals. Um, and there's been a lot of debate in the literature whether or not type 1 interferon stimulated genes or type 1 interferon response could actually induce cytotoxicity or exhaustion. And that doesn't appear to be the case. It looks like these are independent pathways. Um, to further sort of, um, you know, to further give us some, some confidence that these cells may be important for not, not just associated with disease, but maybe causal for disease, is that we uh, amplify the TCR sequence uh, from these cells and asked whether or not the TCR repertoire from lupus patients is more restricted than the repertoire for healthy controls, which would indicate that the, some of these cells are expanded clonally. Um, and that turns out to be the case that the lupus patients have a more restricted repertoire than controls. And that restricted repertoire is particularly um, cells that, are, that have a restricted repertoire are, are more represented by cytotoxic granzyme H positive cells than other cell types. Okay, so, um, you know, so lupus has been studied for, for about 30 years, and there's a number of um, sort of changes in circulation that's already known. One of the features, which I already mentioned earlier, is that um, lupus patients, the blood from lupus patients, seem to be overexpressing these type 1 interferon stimulating genes. Um, and this is, again, something that's known for a couple of decades. And so we wanted to check whether or not we could identify the same signature. But uh, more importantly, can we use single cell sequencing to better contextualize what are the cell types that's producing the signature? Um, and so here, what I'm showing is we basically collapsed all of our data and treated each um, single cell sequencing experiment as though we have performed a bulk experiment. So we just take all the uh, counts for all the transcripts across all single cells and add them up together. And if we do this and do differential expression analysis, um, we were encouraged to see that we can recapitulate sort of this increased expression of type 1 interferon stimulated genes in lupus patients. So lupus patients are in red, healthy controls are in green. Um, and there are these two modules of genes, this black module and this blue module, uh, that are highly enriched for type 1 uh, ISGs. Uh, furthermore, what we know, and this is consistent with the literature, is, is that only about 50% of lupus patients will have high expression of these ISGs, and that's what we see. Um, but what's really great about having single cell sequencing data is that you know, if we just do bulk experiment, you can't tell that these two modules are any different. It looks like the same patients are expressing uh, both of these uh, modules of genes. But if we now um, sort of look at the expression of these modules per cell type, there's 11 major cell types that we identified, um, you can see that they actually uh, you know, are two different clusters. This first cluster of genes, which we call the pan-up cluster, um, are ISGs that are expressed across all cell types versus this blue cluster of genes um, appear to be very specific to cells of uh, myeloid origin. Um, so this really highlights the power of doing single cell sequencing, allowing us to contextualize uh, previously identified bulk signatures. Something else we can do when we do um, single cell sequencing is that we could um, start correlating a number of different molecular traits that we could uh, estimate from the data um, in one experiment. And so I mentioned earlier that we measured naive CD4 abundance, um, and it appears to be uh, lowering lupus patients. And then we also identified this increase um, in the expression of type 1 stimulated genes, particularly in, in myeloid cells. And now if you only take the patients and correlated the activation state in myeloid cells with naive CD4 abundance, we see an inverse correlation. And so the higher the activation of myeloid cells, the lower or the more depleted um, the frequency of, of 90 CD4s. And this is consistent in East Asian as well as European patients. Again, this type of information is really hard to acquire if you're doing flow cytometry to get cell compositional information and then bulk RNA sequencing for each of the major cell types. Uh, but we could get all of this from just doing multiplex single cell sequencing. Um, and we, we think that this is actually consistent with a model uh, where we know that the blood of lupus patients have elevated levels of circulating um, type 1 interferon, the cytokine, uh, 
Uh, I think it, uh, uh, many people would appreciate that this type one interferon cytokine will upregulate type one stimulated genes, particularly monocytes. But perhaps less well appreciated is that um, type one interferons can also affect the trafficking of lymphocytes. And certainly we have data to suggest that naive CD4s might be lost in circulation because they're being stuck in secondary, uh, secondary lymphoid tissue. Um, so we're carrying on a number of, work, a number of projects to try to prove the second arm um, of the pleiotrope effects of, of type 1 interferons. Um, and so this is a fairly large population scale project in addition to look, looking for compositional changes in circulation of, of lupus patients and looking at changes in activation. Uh, we can also do some genetics. Um, and so what we can do is take all our single cell sequencing data um, and perform matrix decomposition, matrix decomposition to estimate for each gene a gene expression profile that's shared across all immune cell types, and then a cell type specific expression profile. Uh, and, and we can use each of these traits to now map for genetic variants that are associated with gene expression. Um, and the goal here, again, is to try to identify genetic variants that may have cell type specific effects. And so when we do this, um, What's encouraging is that we see many genetic variants, almost for every gene that we, we um, profiled, uh, have genetic associations um, that's shared across immune cells types. But there are um, a number of genes that also have an additional cell type specific effect. And for cell types that are related to each other, for example, the non-classical monocytes and classical monocytes, or the CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells, the cell type specificity appears to track with each other. And that's encouraging, right? So I think we're capturing some additional um, cis regulatory activity uh, in this case that are either myeloid or lymphocyte specific. Um, and you know, to, to sort of lend some additional um, evidence that, that our identification of cell type specific genetic variants uh, are real, what we did is we took our list of cell type specific cis EQTLs and overlapped them with uh, cell type specific regions of open chromatin. And this data set was generated by sorting specific immune cell types and then performing a tax seek. Um, and we can see that, for example, B cell specific CCPTLs are enriched for um, regions of open chromatin that are specific in B cells. So again, we think we're capturing real cell type specific cis regulatory elements. And if we use our list of um, cell type specific CCPTLs, uh, we could go back to um, the vast amount of GWAS data that's out there um, and ask, can we identify uh, particular um, circulating cell types that might be more important in mediating disease associations than others? Uh, so we did this for both non-immune traits as well as non-immune traits. And what you can see is that the black line here represents um, EQTLs that are shared across cell types. And so you can see that almost in, in none of these diseases, those EQTLs are statistically enriched. But when you take cell type specific um, cis EQTLs, you can see that there's a number of enrichments. For lupus, it's these B cell specific cis EQTLs and classical monocyte specific cis EQTLs that are enriched for disease associations um, to lupus. Okay, uh, and I just wanna sort of end with an individual example of, of this, um, a particular gene that, that has been somewhat of a conundrum in, in human genetics is ORMDL3. This is actually um, in a locus that's, that's the highest association to, to asthma, but it's also associated with, loop, uh, with lupus and now the largest GWAS in lupus. Um, if we take a look at the expression of ORMDL3 and ask uh, whether or not that's associated with genetic variants in the locus, uh, we can see that there's a number of genetic variants associated with that. But what, what, what's made this locus particularly difficult to, to um, identify a causal variant is that there's a number of other genes, including IKZF3 um, and gastrodermin B, that have implicated immune function and so might be related to asthma and lupus. Um, and so we know that IKZF3 in our data set is not associated with any of the genetic variants in this locus. And then gastrodermin B is associated, uh, again, in across all the cell types so in the shared compartment. Uh, but the association, the strength of association is not as nearly as significant as 1DL3. But what's really interesting is now that if you look at the cell type specific part, uh, there's this additional genetic association in B cells for ORMDL3 and CD8 T cells, but not observing CD4s. And I remember I said earlier that CD8s and CD4s share a lot of the same genetic architecture, but for, for this particular gene, 
um, it appears that the association is only in the share compartment, and then there's some additional association in CD8s and B cells. And on the right, it's just showing sort of the, the actual signals that went into mapping these uh, by picking out the, strong, the most significantly associated genetic variant. So this data um, we've made public at the cell by gene um, portal hosted by CZI. Uh, and it's been public for actually quite some time before the paper is even accepted. Um, and so uh, all of you are welcome to, to explore this data um, and let me know if, if you have any problems accessing this. And I just want to sort of you know, touch on some, some also recent results. Um, we actually use the same strategy of multiplex single cell sequencing um, to profile um, circulating immune cells from COVID-19 patients. And we've been particularly interested in this type one interferon signal. Uh, I mentioned earlier that these two gene modules uh, of type one ISGs that we, we detect to be elevated in lupus patients. Uh, what's really interesting in COVID-19 patients is that patients that present severe disease um, or critical disease requiring mechanical ventilation, so these are the ones in dark red, um, if you take a look at their the expression of their type 1 interferon stimulator genes, um, they don't produce uh, any type 1 ISGs, right? And these genes are important for um, acute antiviral response. And so we were wondering whether or not uh, this could actually explain uh, what, whether or not somebody ends up in, in um, the ICU because, uh, because they just basically are not producing an antiviral response. Uh, and this actually um, is piggybacking off of some, some work that was published by Jean-Laurent Casanova in Science showing that you know, critical patients with COVID-19 have autoantibodies against type 1 interferons. And so if we look in our cohort of uh, critical COVID patients, we would produce that result, about 20% of critical COVID patients have autoantibodies against type 1 interferons. And those patients, they don't produce a type 1 interferon response, uh, as we see. But there are also a number of other severe COVID-19 patients who don't have autoantibodies, at least ones that we can detect, but they also have a deficient type 1 interferon response. So we think that this may actually be a general mechanism um, for um, sort of inhibiting some, there's something else that's inhibiting our antiviral response uh, in that this may actually um, increase somebody's susceptibility to developing critical COVID. Um, and so what's next? So um, we've, you know, what I showed is some data where we use multiplex single cell sequencing to study lupus. There's a number of other cohorts that we're studying, including Sjogren's disease, type 1 diabetes, scleroderma, ulcerative colitis, uh, Crohn's, and, and psoriatic spectrum disease. Um, we're also starting to use this technology in our molecular consult service at UCSF to diagnose patients with rare um, immune diseases that are, that are often orphan diseases. Um, and we uh, are also starting to now really scale our efforts in cancer immunotherapy. I show, some, I show some limited data in bladder cancer, but now we have much larger cohorts across a number of uh, solid tissue uh, uh, tumors um, and, and patients who are being treated with uh, checkpoint blockade. Um, in addition to COVID-19, we're also doing um, studies in tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, as well as influenza. Um, and then importantly, a lot, you know, a lot of this actually happened without having a human a, a reference of, of healthy controls. And so in collaboration with Chang Zuckerberg Initiative and the Human Cell Atlas, um, we're embarking on a study to try to collect uh, about 10 million cells across four different um, human um, populations, 100 samples each, uh, and also to sample um, people across some um, important biological um, uh, rhythms, including time of the year, uh, the, the menstrual cycle as well as natural aging. So we think by collecting this immune cell census and healthy controls, we can better understand the, um, the dynamics of natural variability, which hopefully will allow us to better interpret some of the results coming out of um, sequencing disease cohorts. Okay, so that's sort of, I guess in, in single cell genomics, that's ancient technology and, and that application to studying complex disease. For the rest of the time, I wanna uh, to showcase two vignettes on, on some new technologies that my lab is developing that we're particularly excited about. Um, and the first piece is, is called combinatorial index single cell proteomics. Um, and you know, I, I want to go back to this slide where, you know, in, up, up to 2018 and still now, um, most of the community is, is basically using the 10x genomics uh, platform. Um, and so how do we, if we want to generate even more data, and I could sort of, you know, talk offline about the, the merits of, of wanting to generate more data, the kind of biology we can go after. So how do we continue this trend of, of exponential growth? 
Um, and, and so we're going to require some new technologies. MuxSeq basically allowed us to increase the throughput by fivefold, but that's not at order of magnitude. Um, and I want to showcase a, a few methods that will allow us to go um, further. Um, and so the first approach it uses this idea called combinatorial indexing. Um, intuitively, what we're trying to do is uh, in a standard single cell genomics run with, with these uh, droplets, uh, again, we basically waste a lot of reagents uh, because, of Poisson, because of the Poisson process. Uh, what we did with sample multiplexing is that we can increase the throughput uh, and allow us to identify these droplets that contain cells from different individuals and throw that data away, but that data is not used. Uh, what we would like to do, um, and what, we're, what, we're, uh, what we've now done, is, is basically to, to make every single droplet in a 10x microfluidic run productive. So we use all of the reagents. Um, and we don't want to be, we don't want to throw these data sets away where there's multiple cells encapsulated. We need, we want to figure out a way where we can basically deconvolve all of this data, right? And so actually people have worked on this problem before computationally, uh, but we want to do this experimentally. Uh, and if we can do this, we can basically increase the throughput from about 5,000 cells per reaction to about 250,000 or a 50x increasing throughput. And that will allow us to do a number of um, new, new projects that I think will require this throughput. So here's how we do it for one particular modality, and there's related papers on how we can do this for other modalities. So we're particularly interested um, in, in using uh, combinatorial indexing to just profile sur cell surface protein expression. So we're going to use antibodies uh, conjugated with the DNA molecule. So I described that earlier. It's very similar to CyCyc. Um, but what we're going to do um, in addition to this is add a, a second um, DNA molecule. Uh, and we're going to add it in a way where uh, the second DNA molecule can be hybridized in a pool. And so we make sets of these antibodies, and then we divide these sets into um, a number of different pools. In this example, we have three different pools. And then we're going to stain cells in pools. And, and by doing this, we basically introduce this first round of barcoding that's specific to each pool. So pool one will have this purple barcode, pool two will have an orange barcode, and pool three will have this brown barcode. Now, because in a droplet, it's governed, the encapsulation of cells in a droplet are, is governed by Poisson process, the probability that more than, let's say, five cells or six cells can go into each droplet, even when every single droplet is productive, is very low, which means that if we pull all of the cells back up together and redistribute them into droplets, the probability that two cells uh, encapsulating the same droplet will have the same pool barcode is very small. And so we don't need that many pools to start with for us to now use the combination of the droplet barcode and the pool barcode as a unique barcode for each single cell. And so the analogy here is it's sort of the birthday problem. I think a lot of us remember this from high school. You know, how many people will have, um, you know, how many people in a room um, will we need to sort of like guarantee with very high probability that two people will have the same birthday, right? It's always smaller than the number that we expect. And so it's the same thing here is that that first barcode is basically month um, of the year that that cell is born on, born in, and then the second is the day of the month that that cell is born on. And so the combination of the month and the day gives you a unique birthday or a single cell barcode. Um, and so that's the concept that we try to run this. Um, so this is sequencing peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Um, in total, we loaded 200,000 cells into a single 10X channel. Um, and we recovered 50,000 droplets that contain cells. And if we don't use that initial barcode and we just look at the 50,000 barcodes, again, you know, usually what you get out is 5,000 barcodes, we get 50,000, so that's a 10X increasing throughput. But since some of these droplets, a lot of these droplets will contain multiple cells, we basically can't resolve any of the data, right? So these are um, peripheral blood cells. We know that there's CD4, CD8s, CD14, CD19s, and CD56 positive cells. Um, but it looks like the cells are going everywhere. Uh, but now we include that first barcode, we can actually resolve um, up, upwards of about 100,000 cells, right? So that's already a 20x increase in throughput. And we can identify your CD4 positive T cells, CDA positive T cells, CD14 positive myeloid cells, CD19 positive B cells, and then these natural killer cells that are 56 positive. Um, so that's our proof of principle. Um, and then just to, to convince ourselves that the data is comparable to other high throughput cytometry based methods, we compared our data set to CYTOF, which conjugates heavy metals onto antibodies. And we used the exact same antibody clones and conjugated them with 28 different heavy metals. 
um, and we ran our samples. And qualitatively, we basically get the same data as CITOF. And then quantitatively, uh, the frequencies of the various cell populations are also very similar. Um, but what's nice about sequencing uh, compared to, you know, for example, um, chelating with heavy metals is that we use DNA to label, um, well, both cells as well as these uh, antibodies. And that gives us a lot of flexibility. One of the flexibilities it gives us is that we, depending on the way we sort of design this hybridization molecule, we can get our reagents to be compatible with a number of different commercially available uh, single cell sequencing platforms. Um, and so we could do three prime sequencing, five prime sequencing, as well as compatibility with uh, the Chrome 10 accessibility kit that 10X is now selling. Um, the other thing that, that we could do is, is we could also design the hybridization oligo to be compatible with commercially available um, antibodies that are conjugated with DNA molecules. Um, and just to showcase this, you know, we, what we did is we now made a 60 plex um, antibody panel internally and sequence 175,000 cells in a single run of the 10X instrument. Again, that's compared to 5,000. So now we're getting closer to that 50X throughput. Um, and then we also sequence the same samples using a different antibody panel, so by BioLegend. And this is a 165 plex panel. And again, get about 175,000 cells. Um, and here we can quantitatively compare these two data sets since so the same individuals that were sequenced and both in terms of cell composition on top as well as cell type specific expression um, for each of these cell types, uh, we can see that you know, there's high correlation between uh, these two data sets, suggesting that you know, CytoC can both capture inter-individual variation in cell composition, as well as inter-individual variation in the expression of individual cell surface markers for a particular cell type. Um, we can also engineer the system to, to be able to do multimodality um, to get compatibility with a, a method that was recently published by Christoph Fox Lab called Sci-Fi. And so now we can simultaneously get single cell proteomic data as well as single cell RNA sequencing data from potentially hundreds of thousands of cells uh, per reaction of 10X. And so here, this is just a proof of principle experiment, mixing cells from five different cell lines. Um, and if you can, uh, you know, on top, we're, identical, we're basically looking at the surface uh, expression of um, surface molecules that's specific to each cell line. And on the bottom, we're looking at an aggregated score from the transcriptome um, of each cell. And again, that appears to line up, right? So we identify um, the CD29 specific surface protein as well as a HeLa score. Um, and these uh, seem to be lighting up the same cells. Um, and then the second vignette, um, is, is uh, to now think about using combinatorial indexing again to do single cell sequencing, but can we um, encode additional orthogonal information into, into uh, these combinatorial indexing libraries? Um, and the particular types of information that we want to encode is, is spatial information. And so I think, you know, for many of you, I, I hope you can appreciate that when we look at complex tissue, the distribution of cells within complex tissue is not random. My lab is particularly interested in the immune system, and we know that um, immune cells that infiltrate tish, uh, tissue is not randomly distributed. So in this case, cytotoxic T cells, these yellow T cells versus regulatory T cells, which are fewer in green, um, have a very different localization pattern than, for example, macrophages that are in purple. Uh, but when you perform single cell sequencing, when we digest cells from complex tissue or try to isolate cells or nuclei and then perform single cell sequencing, we basically destroy uh, all of the um, spatial information about the cells. And so we want to figure out a way uh, to, to try to um, retain some of that spatial information. And so the way we do this is we basically use the same combinatorial indexing idea I introduced earlier for CytoSeq, but now we're going to try to encode additional information into these combinatorial indices, especially that first round. So here's how we're going to do it. Um, instead of in, in CytoSeq I presented earlier, we basically do combinatorial indexing in vials but what we're now going to do is combinatorial indexing in wells. Um, and that first round uh, of combinatorial indexing uh, is going to happen in these 500 micron honeycombs. Um, and uh, we can actually also do this in, in 200 micron honeycombs as well. Uh, 500 microns is roughly the um, diameter of about you know, 10 to 50 cells, depending on the size of the cell. Uh, and we made them honeycomb for a number of reasons. One, we want to avoid 90 degree angles to avoid tenting effects and also to be able to get cells out of these honeycombs in a second round. Uh, but we also want to minimize death space between, the, uh, between these um, spatial wells. 
So on the right is, is a zoomed out version of, of one of these chips. It's about a third of the size of pathology array. Um, and that's by design because we want to eventually, um, if we can get these into the hands of pathologists and we wonder if this could be a new digital pathology uh, tool. Uh, so here's how the assay actually works. Um, with these arrays, what we do is, um, so in this particular one, there's 768 wells. Uh, and so we're going to barcode each well with a um, DNA molecule. Uh, these DNA molecules also have poly DTs on them, so they can act as primers for reverse transcription. And then we're going to digest a piece of tissue over these wells um, and semi permeabilize the cells and perform reverse transcription within a cell, so in C2 reverse transcription. And then we will pull all the cells back out and sort them into a second round of PCR barcodes. Um, and again, you know, that first round is basically, um, here I'm using a different analogy, the street address analogy. That first round gives you the street address where that cell is. The second round is uh, the street number. Um, now, because we have so many wells initially, uh, we can actually put quite a few cells into the second round uh, to guarantee that the, the collision rate or two cells with the same barcode is going to be very low. And the data that we get out is bona fide single cell sequencing data. So we actually um, can sort of analyze the data the same way that all of the single cell other single cell sequencing data sets can be analyzed. But we can also now uh, assign each cell to, to a spatial location limited, of course, by the uh, spatial resolution of, of these physical wells. And so here's what the data looks like. This is a mouse tumor model. Uh, we take a mouse liver and then injecting MC38 tumor into the, into the animal. Um, and so this is actually a slice that we're going to take to do uh, XYZ. Um, and then we are going to take a neighboring slice and, and do um, h and stain. And so the light stain is where the liver is. The dark stain is where the tumor is. And when we perform XYZ, what we get out is, um, again, on top is, is actual single cell sequencing data. Each dot here represents a cell and it's colored by cell type. Um, and then on the bottom um, is sort of where these cells are going in space. So if we look at the red cells, which are hepatocytes or liver cells, um, they overlap with where the liver stain is. And then if we take the uh, yellow cells, which are the M38 tumor cells, they overlap with where, where the tumor cells are. So this is quite encouraging. Um, and so what can you do with this? Why is XYZ sort of like better than single cell sequencing? Um, here's, here's sort of an illustrative example from our data set. Um, there's actually these po two populations of innate immune cells uh, they're very close to each other in this projection because they're phenotypically related. And we actually have to do a lot of analytical gymnastics to sort of get them to cluster out to, to different clusters. Um, but the spatial distribution of these cells is very different. So if you take this light green cluster, you can see that um, they localize, it looks like, with the tumor. If you take that orange cluster, they localize with the liver. And that uh, light green cluster are macrophages. And it's known that the macrophages will, uh, will cluster with MC38 tumor. And then these orange cells are the Cooper cells, which are liver resident macrophage like cells. Um, and again, that makes a lot of sense that they will co localize with the liver. And so, here, by simultaneously have single, having single cell data and spatial data, we can use the spatial information to identify cell types that might be co localizing. Um, but what about compared to other spatial transcriptomics? Um, this is just a comparison to, to somewhat low resolution spatial transcriptomics. I'm happy to talk about what I think some of the benefits are uh, compared to much higher resolution spatial transcriptomics. But imagine you were doing um, you know, some sort of Visium 1.0 and you're on the order of hundreds of microns. You can identify genes that are spatially differentially expressed. And so these are two gene sets that are both spatially differentially expressed. Uh, but that's it, right? It's hard to figure out what are the cell types that's actually driving the signature. But if you now project the expression of each of these modules onto our single cell data set, uh, you can see that there is this tumor response module that's actually expressed by a subset of MC38 cells. And then there's this immune regulation model, module that's expressed almost exclusively by these macrophages. Um, and so the single, the single cell data um, allows us to contextualize spatially differentiated um, expressed genes. So um, I'll end here and then take some questions. Um, I introduced MuxSeq, which is uh, our approach to do population scale single cell genomics. We think it's an unprecedented opportunity to use single cell sequencing to capture simultaneously variation in cell composition, as well as activation states of cells. Um, we apply this to study systemic lupus erythematosus and identify a increase in type 1 interferon response in monocytes that appears to be inversely correlated 
with um, the uh, abundance of naive CD4s. We also were able to identify a, a population of granzyme H positive T cells that are clonally expanded um, and transcriptionally heterogeneous. Um, and by integrating in genetic information uh, in our cohort and, uh, and, and publicly available GWAS data, we can map cell type specific uh, exist EQTLs, and, uh, which we think is, is better for annotating um, lupus associated variants, but also variants associated with other autoimmune diseases. Um, and then I introduced two new combinatorial indexing technologies uh, that will um, increase the throughput for single cell sequencing. Um, and so we envision something like SATA seeking, we're actually doing this in the lab, can be now used for these large scale um, perturbation based for genetic screens. So now we're, for example, trying to knock out every single gene in the human genome and observe the consequences of those perturbations on hundreds of surface markers simultaneously. We were doing this with CRISPR-N, CRISPR-A as, with, as well as CRISPR-I. Some limited work in my lab um, also in, in trying to use these approaches to assess the effects of, of um, just transduced ORFs. Um, and then uh, XYZ, uh, which encodes some additional orthogonal information into these combinatorial indexing libraries, sorry. Um, and, and here we're in, in encoding spatial information and what we're building on top of this for XYZ2 is to try to achieve multimodality, um, FFP compatibility, as well as immune, fin uh, immune repertoire um, typing. Uh, and hopefully down the road, we'll be able to also um, sequence out the sgRNA of cells that are edited. And so our vision is, is to be eventually um, going to a mouse with edited immune cells and be able to track where those cells are actually going in tissue. Um, so that's the work and that's all the people who, who did the work. Um, and I just want to give a quick shout out that, that I am recruiting. And so if, uh, any trainees in the audience are interested in this type of work, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Great. Thanks, Jimmy. Really exciting talk. All right. Uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to go up and ask directly or type it in the chat. And um, I have an initial question for you, Jimmy. Um, so you mentioned early in your, in your talk uh, that you can do this demuxlet trick with 10x multiome data as well. Um, and you showed that you can sort of separately use the attack and the RNA to, to, to uh, assign genotypes. But um, I'm just curious, does having both really actually improve it? Um, you know, to be honest with you, we haven't systematically Sort of like assess that in general demultiplexing is really easy uh what's hard is in some cases identifying right multiple droplets from different people especially when you have contaminating you know cdna molecules or rna molecules if you have a lot of dead cells that that's actually quite challenging um in general if you just compare attack to rna attack will be better because you have more genetic variation uh and but yeah we haven't systematically compared. Okay. Uh, looks like Steve Parker has a question. Hi there, this is Steve Parker. Really, really exciting, beautiful work. Congratulations. All the cool stuff. We, and just aside, we use Demuxlet on a routine basis. It is a wonderful, awesome. Thank you. wonderful tool for exactly the types of studies that you outlined. Um, I, I was curious about the EQTL analyses that you did. A lot of, uh, I didn't catch if you're doing this Pseudo bulk or using some sort of a single cell model for your EQTL scans. Can you say more about that? And then as a follow up, the the um, the ORM D three L I think it was locus that you showed was it had this like really really extended LD structure. And I wonder, did you do a formal co localization analysis there? And and does it look like it holds up, or is is, or is it just kind of eyeballing LZ plots? Uh, we did do, okay, yeah, so the first question, um, we did, it's all pseudobulk. Uh, we are, we have a few ideas for how to sort of do the actual single cell based EQTL mapping. Um, for ORMDL3, yes, it's extended LD, but, you know, if you do like Bayesian co-loc, I think our, I forgot exactly what our post probabilities are, but it's, it's like, it's greater than 85% that we can co-localize. The, both the share signal as well as the B cell and T cell that CDA specific signals. Cool, very cool. Yeah, there was a talk earlier today at ASHG about using 
plus on uh, mixed models for, for yeah. But I, I don't know, we're, we're doing similar things. I think we're meeting one-on-one -on -one tomorrow. So I have a ton of questions I'll follow up then, but really, really great stuff, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for Jimmy? All right, if not, I'll let you go. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks for having me again. Hi, everyone, and looking forward to meeting some of you tomorrow.